In four horrific days in April 1906, the heart of San Francisco's civic, economic, and cultural life vanished. In the aftermath of the earthquake, as the sense of shock lifted, a new passion arose to rebuild San Francisco, bigger, better, more beautiful than before. Well, the great earthquake of 1906 was the making of the city as we now understand it. I mean, it was a great disaster, but the uh, way the city rallied to not only rebuild the city, but to try and rebuild a city that was of much greater significance than the one that had been destroyed. And a major part of that plan had to do with the arts, specifically with classical music, the opera, and the symphony. San Francisco, like the phoenix emblazoned on the city's flag, re-emerged from the ashes with breathtaking speed. It was a time for bold initiatives. In mid-December, a group of 10 civic-minded music lovers met at the Mercantile Trust Company's offices on California Street. Their objective to augment the city's resurgent cultural life by establishing a professional orchestra. For years, people had been thinking, we, we must have an orchestra here. We must have an orchestra. And there had been some tries before. There had been earlier attempts. There had been a number of different symphonies uh, in and around San Francisco. But this was now the moment to put this totally on the map. By August 1911, the Musical Association raised $220,000 through the contributions of 2,400 San Franciscans. It was ready for the next step, hiring the conductor. Among the candidates were two renowned Europeans and one American, Henry Hadley, the music director of the fledgling Seattle Symphony. So that was most significant, that the symphony would choose as its first conductor an American and also a composer, someone associated with what was then contemporary music. Uh, all of these things were very forward in their thinking. He wasn't a big name conductor, but he was very, very good. I think he was a perfect choice to get this orchestra off the ground. When he arrived in October, Henry Hadley went to work immediately, charming the city's downtown association and making a whirlwind tour of theaters and cafes to find the best musicians San Francisco had to offer. People made music live, which means that a city like San Francisco had bands and musicians everywhere. They worked in hotels, they worked in restaurants, they worked in theaters, they worked in bars. All those places had their own orchestras. And that's where Hadley went to recruit them. In under a month, he assembled an orchestra of 60 musicians. But there was a hitch. All the best musicians in San Francisco had other jobs. Their other jobs kept them busy at night. So all the symphony's performances would have to be matinees. They didn't have a concert hall, so they had to use the court theater, which was a very, very busy theater at night. And as a result, they couldn't use that except for the off times for the theater. So everything had to be worked around that. On Friday afternoon, December 8, 1911, a crowd described as one of the most fashionable ever to attend a matinee 
began gathering outside the court theater for the debut of the San Francisco Orchestra. Hadley meant to dazzle them with program of blockbusters. Liszt's Les Preludes, uh, Wagner's Overture to Die Meistersinger, the Tchaikovsky Pathetic Symphony. And the audience obliged at the end with what Wickham described as applause, hand clapping, and thunderous cheers. That first season, the San Francisco Symphony would perform 13 times. To create a symphony for all, the season included Sunday concerts for working people and two performances across the Bay in Oakland. Within a year, Harvey Wickham of the San Francisco Chronicle would write, the orchestra, which was a novelty, has become an institution. By 1950, the San Francisco Symphony had completed four successful seasons. Late in February, the glimmering symbol of San Francisco resurgent, the Panama Pacific International Exposition, opened along the shore of San Francisco Bay. Among the headline attractions, the Boston Symphony Orchestra. When the music began, it was nothing short of a revelation. What happened is the Boston Symphony came to town. And <laughs> as good as the San Francisco Symphony was for where it was and the time it was, our poor orchestra was not coming out very well in comparison. Uh, as a result, I think that that left to a lot of soul searching. The limitations of the young San Francisco Symphony under Hadley were evident. Recognizing the need to take the orchestra to the next level, the Musical Association began considering options. By July, amidst much controversy, the decision was made to hire Alfred Hertz, the recently retired conductor of New York's Metropolitan Opera. The critics raved. Hadley was out. Hertz was in. <laughs> Hertz, well, for one thing, you have to imagine a great big genial bear because he was a great big man, horizontally, mostly. Uh, he had a big beard, and when he conducted, this is a wonderful true story, he perspired like crazy. One of the juniors in the orchestra was always assigned the task of going backstage after the concert and mopping down the maestro. Everything about Hertz was different. He was short, bald, overweight, and a demanding perfectionist. The orchestra expanded, musicianship improved, and in a first for any major orchestra in the United States, Hertz hired women to play instruments other than harp. For the San Francisco Symphony, Alfred Hertz would make all the difference.